Welcome now um, to the seventh of the webinar series under the um, TurboClix working group of the sector network, uh, cross sector network from Truevas and SNRD, um, SNGA. Sorry, Eva. Um, uh, we, of course, are called the Transformation Urban Opportunities and Climate Change Group. Um, coming back to the topic for today. Uh, innovative, innovations and impacts of inclusive and equitable cities, one of the toughest topics I would say that we have. But we have three very smart presenters. I, I hope the third one is able to join. And we will have a very interesting uh, variation in their presentations. We have Ms. Eva, Eva Ringoff, who will present on inclusive urban infrastructure investments, innovation responses, to service delivery and access. Uh, we will just shift up Arpan Majumdar, who was supposed to be presenting as the third presenter. And he will be talking about reconfiguring spatial order, making Indian cities inclusive. Uh, Esther Wegner, hoping she will be able to join and present, talks about making southern, South African cities safer and more inclusive, integrating the <laughs> on violence and crime prevention, but looks like Esther's headphones or microphone is still not working. Hoping for the best, um, just a small um, um, uh, small, uh, small words on the webinar series and why we are doing this. The idea is, of course, to uh, look at intensive exchange of experience and good practices among projects but also to move towards joint learning on new topics and offer a lively platform for interaction and networking. Onboarding new colleagues is one of the, also one of the aims of this. But with, without much ado, I will introduce the uh, uh, speakers to you. So um, Eva is, uh, uh, a social urban development specialist at the C uh, Cities Development Initiatives for Asia, CDIA, in Manila, Philippines, and joint speaker of the TurboClick community. Uh, since joining CDIA in 2013, uh, she has been working on governance aspects and inclusive development of CDIA's city interventions in Asia. She's the country manager for Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka and is responsible for coordinating national partner organizations and support ongoing prioritization and pre-feasibility studies for different infrastructure sectors. She has seven years of experience in environmental consulting, social and environmental standards, and impact assessment in, in uh, countries like Colombia, Peru, South Korea, and Singapore. She has a master's in spatial and environmental planning and a post-grade in uh, international cooperation focusing on urban sociology. I will move on to introduce all the others as well. Uh, Mr. Arpan Majumdar is currently working for GIZ Inclusive Cities Partnership Program, which supports the agenda for Government of India in a, making affordable housing available to the urban poor. He is an architect and an urban planner by training and has a professional experience of over five years. He has worked on projects related to housing, slum, and environmental improvement, urban development, and renewal. With his consultancy background, he offers a sound understanding of the various aspects of project planning and implementation. He's also a very keen sketcher and uh, has abilities of designing. I hope, let's see, his presentation must be interesting. And the last presenter today would be Ms. Esther Wegner, who works as a technical advisor in inclusive violence and crime prevention program in South Africa. Before joining the program um, in September 2016, Esther has worked with two other GIZ programs in Germany. And in uh, 2013, she became part of the team at the sector program on policy advice for urban development in Eschborn, Germany. From September to July, she has been uh, supported the program on uh, project on international implementation of urban uh, energies and memorandum. Esther has studied political science, international relations in Germany, and has an MSc in global urban development and planning. Hoping Esther's problems get solved and we are really able to listen to her. 
but before much ado i will pass on the mic to uh, eva we will take the question uh, and answers in the interactive session at the end of the program in case during the uh, presentation you have some urge to ask a question please feel free to type in the chat and we will take that up once we end all the presentations eva Thank you a lot, Vaishali. Uh, well, first of all, I'm very keen to discuss this topic right now because inclusive and equitable urban development was a big concern during all the Abitur 3 processes in Surabaya and I heard also in Quito. Um, today with my presentation, I want to provide insights about how we ensure inclusive development once a city development plan is in place. And to understand the, the approach, I will give a short introduction. What is CDIA, the City Development Initiative for Asia? And then explain um, two city case studies, one from Southeast Asia and another from South Asia. Um, yeah, well, CDIA um, emerged from the idea to jointly assist cities to improve project preparation and speed up infrastructure financing. So the main idea is actually linking cities to finance. Um, CDIA provides technical assistance to medium-sized cities. That means for us in Asia, 250,000, up to 5 million inhabitants to bridge the gap between uh, the development plans. We call it the upstream, as you can see here on the left and the implementation of their infrastructure investments, the downstream, we call it. You see it on the right. So we, su uh, so actually we, um, we support to shape pro a project technically from the socio-economic and environmental perspective and financially feasible to, uh, by identifying uh, urban investment projects and link them with potential financiers. Um, to, yeah, like looking into the global agendas, uh, the initiative contributes to uh, the SDG 11 for sure and all of its 10 targets. Here I have some of the examples, as you can see, um, to the 10 targets. Um, we are working in 17 countries in Asia. Um, and there are, we have a lot of topics, uh, for example, the safe and affordable housing, as you see here in Mongolia, then on other targets like affordable transport, reducing greenhouse uh, gas emissions, and the support of socioeconomic links between urban and rural linkages, especially here in Pakistan, but also in other regions as well, um, solid waste management, our um, working group here, TurboClick, is a lot dealing with solid waste management. Um, there I will also focus on one of the examples uh, that is in Tangerang, Indonesia. So um, we support the identification and the development of urban investment uh, projects that emphasize at least uh, two of the following impact areas urban environmental improvement, climate change mitigation and adaptation, urban poverty reduction, or improved governance. Today I will focus on the uh, yellow one, on the urban poverty reduction. Um, yeah, we call it now actually on an inclusive approach, um, yeah, like inclusive urban development. And um, our idea is actually to focus on the benefit for cities, because a lot of cities, if you compare it to the city officials, nobody wants to live in a uh, yeah, poor city. So we try to strengthen the positive aspect and also what is really behind the idea on inclusive urban development um, and to show the examples of how it can activate the local economy so to see the formal and informal sector dynamics, how it improved the city image for the investments. Um, there is a lot behind the idea on a vision for investments in an inclusive 
city image. Um, we also create competitive cities, so re uh, resilient, clean and healthy uh, cities. And for sure, uh, we look into how to increase the local revenues. Um, as we're supporting uh, the linking to finance aspects, we not always want a city to take a loan from a bank and don't look into their own balance sheet on how to uh, how to generate own income. So especially on taxes and and fee systems. So the question is, how do we ensure actually inclusive development? For that. Uh, we use a tool, I won't explain it in detail, that ha has nine steps. We call it the Inclusive Development Checklist. And here uh, I will give you some of the insights, especially for the step five, that is uh, specific design features to ensure the proper impacts. Um, and uh, yeah, well, we want to make sure that all impacts are well known and assessed. But the most important is actually uh, from step five to step nine, also the um, the financial considerations. So uh, what are the key factors? This gives you an overview for all different kind of infrastructures we are sectors we are working. So for each of these sectors, uh, we identified some quite good practices, as you can see here, for example, urban renewal, that we think into uh, providing subventions and incentives, uh, that we look into affordable materials, and also new business opportunities, um, as well in, for example, urban transport, uh, like bicycle routes, safe parking, sidewalks. Um, we have some of these collected, and we also discuss it with the, with the consultants, actually, on the field. So now comes the exciting part. So I will give you some introductions to two examples. Um, one is Tangerang in Indonesia. The challenge in, in, the, in, in Tangerang is that um, the urban expansion in Jakarta has already impacted Tangerang, that is quite close to Jakarta. It has a high population growth and over 1,000 factories. So given that the waste generation is uh, quite high, with an estimate of 1,500 tons per day, the city is running out of landfill spaces and therefore faces uh, difficulties in, in finding appropriate land for landfilling. And unfortunately, in 2006, Tangerang was declared the dirtiest city in Indonesia. So this was actually the uh, yeah, context when we started. What uh, were our responses and in innovations? Uh, we worked on four investment packages especially the two first ones are quite interesting, the collection and transportation, where we recommended the collection uh, and transportation scheme in selected pilot areas, especially targeted on, on uh, the urban poor. And uh, we suggested the expansion of the coverage uh, in the following two years to reach the full capacity by the year 2018. Uh, in the second, uh, package material recovery facility. Uh, we have a, a, a quite nice approach on um, on actually how we uh, how, how we can improve recovery facilities. So um, for um, I, I will give some more details on on this investment package too, um, especially on how we increased the inclusiveness for that. Um, maybe you already heard about waste banks. Uh, waste banks are mainly uh, operated by by women. So uh, by 2015, the city has established more than 100 waste banks and has revitalized the landfill. Um, in combination with the waste banks, they also increased public awareness and engagement to uh, social events, like they organized this uh, waste festival. Um, and it was held to complement community-based waste segregation schemes. Um, what was the key factor that actually made it inclusive? Uh, one of the key factors was the safeguarding implementation and monitoring that we found very uh, useful. Our consultants worked closely with the city officials 
um, so um, we came up with a whole table um, to, to monitor that the objective will be met on employment of women through material recovery and to connect it uh, to, to handicrafts and uh, yeah, a lot of um, new employment uh, opportunities. Another key factor was the financial consideration as you can see here, also the installation of waste banks for recycling and art need to be integrated from the beginning. In this case, it's quite low cost because you can already set it up uh, with a quite low amount of 5,000 US dollars. Yeah, I come to another example that is in South Asia, Colombo. So um, it has a lot of challenges on uh, the existing sewer system. It was still from the colonial time. They have a lot of issues with uh, solid waste dumping into the wastewater system, with illegal stormwater uh, connections, and uh, little possible financial resources and cost recovery options. And uh, a weak institutional system and few capacity of municipal management. So our inclusive responses were actually, um, especially on minimizing resettlement issues, for example, to space re um, reduction for facilities and to consider new technologies like the vacuum sewer networks. It hasn't been selected, but uh, maybe you know also the, the program that is uh, promoting it here from the region, the urban nexus. Uh, but we decided to, uh, to, to really look into it because the city also requested for its demand. Um, another inclusive response was the social safeguard and resettlement action plan. So we included skills training, involvement of community-based organizations and women in the implementation and awareness uh, raising campaigns on wastewater management and sanitation. The third one was an affordable service provision, so an analysis of expenditure for wastewater and sanitation, and to look into uh, yeah, like a block tariff for low-income families for that. Um, yeah, one of the, the major key factors was the pay participation because we set up a steering committee with higher officials and politicians to oversee the study and uh, also to, to enable decisions. A working group that is cooperating on a daily basis um, and normally the officials whose expertise matches those of the consultants are into this working group. We connected it with public events and some roundtables and had several focus group discussions. Yeah, as I see my time is running out, but um, yeah, an another key factor that the city said it was most useful was actually targeting and uh, including inclusive indicators in the project design monitoring framework. So in a kind of a lock frame. Um, that we really ensure uh, that we are measuring uh, the beneficiaries or that it is uh, measured against the, uh, the poor and disadvantaged residents and not only on how, um, how long was the pipeline constructed. Uh, and there we measured employment and livelihood opportunities and uh, waterborne, uh, the reduction of waterborne diseases uh, for health issues. Um, as a lot of infrastructure projects also, um, yeah, it often includes or it is necessary resettlement. So we made sure that these uh, safeguard costs will be included uh, in the project implementation costs. Uh, if you consider it as a total sum, it's not a lot, it's less than 2% of the total costs. Um, it's approximately 3 million US dollars in total. So there was an agreement with the Urban Development Authority to provide the apartment for 37 um, families living in these underserved settlements with a cost of um, yeah, 34,000 US dollar for a house. Um, there are a lot of challenges and limitations for us to, uh, to, to work on this approach. For sure, it's a short-term consulting, so only three to six months. Um, you don't have a lot of time 
to have really detailed data, so data availability is an issue, and also that it is not a, a binding nature. The financier, in a later step, he can really put uh, requirements on a loan, but uh, our approach is actually not really uh, binding for the city. But it has a lot of benefits and potentials, not only for the city, also for the financier. Um, it is an integrated and improved project preparation for sure because you can get uh, the business plan as it is for the project analyzed with all risks and costs. Um, institutional arrangements are also addressed from the beginning and it serves as a guide for further uh, investigation, especially in resettlement issues. We address it from the beginning. Um, but then um, it, it often needs a, a detailed study once the financial takes over. And with the working groups and the steering committee, we reach a high um, participation and commitment of the stakeholders and for sure an ownership. Um, yeah, and, and finally it includes a, a, a development impact assessment to analyze these poverty and social um, impacts that is um, that reduces also the burden um, for um, for the financial at the end. So um, thank you a lot. And if you uh, know a city that would actually be interested or would be in need of a pre-feasibility study, uh, we are very happy to consider it. The requirement is uh, can be seen on our webpage. And what is necessary is that um, uh, yeah, a city development strategy or plan at least is in place. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Eva. Thank you so much. Uh, um, it's, it's very interesting to see how Indonesia and Sri Lanka are moving with the various initiatives that you were highlighting. Um, there's already a question, but maybe we will take that later. Uh, Arpan, can I request you to take over? Yeah. Uh, I think we will have to probably jump to your presentation. It would be in the after Esther's presentation. So, Esther, um, sorry, Arpan is here with me, and uh, you'll be presenting from my system. One minute. So, you will just have to do a little back and forth, unfortunately. Okay, so here we are. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hi, this is Arpan. I'm working with uh, this program called Inclusive Cities Partnership Program, which is based in uh, India. And uh, we are working with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Poverty Alleviation and by supporting them in their aim for, you know, making affordable housing you know, available to the urban poor. So, uh, jumping to the presentation, first we have, first I'll take you through the uh, content of the presentation, the things that I'll be presenting. First we'll give a slight overview about the urbanization in India, followed by the India's new urban agenda for Habitat 3, which was finalized. Uh, then we'll go to the a particular case study, the city that we are dealing with, with case study of Puri and Odisha. So, and in case of uh, Puri City, we'll give a brief overview about the local economy, the urbanization issues there, uh, the issue of uh, lack of green open spaces, you know, plus Puri is also uh, located on the coastal zone, so it faces the wrath of nature quite regularly. Then under the uh, interventions under the program, we'll uh, give you an overview of the uh, components that we are dealing with, uh, followed by the interventions in Puri. So,
so as we all know uh, india is the largest democracy in the world and uh, and uh, with a population of about 1.2 billion people you know that's <laughs> that's quite possible but uh, if we look at the uh, urbanization trend in india you know what the very first time since independence the absolute increase in population is more in urban areas rather than rural areas so the level of urbanization has increased from 27.81% in 2001 to 31.6% and uh, urban areas covered just 2.3% of india's total land area but uh, it uh, you know caters to around 31% of the total population in india so as we can all imagine there is huge amount of pressure uh, in terms of infrastructure land on these urban areas in india which are you know sprawling now uh, in the recently concluded habitat 3 event the india's new urban agenda was finalized and uh, these are the eight uh, components that have been finalized out of which you know focus on uh, you know spatial planning urban planning uh there is focus on you know provision and finance for housing and infrastructure there is also the provision for harnessing the our rural urban continuum there is also the provision for promoting inclusive urban development uh, along with harmonizing the agglomeration economies uh, strengthening the local governance uh, increasing access to social justice and gender equity uh, creating robust information system and knowledge management and uh, promoting the principles of corporate federalism so as we can see that there is a strong focus on uh, the spatial component of planning which will be uh, taking up in our uh, uh, program now if we come to the uh, case study of uh, odisha which is a state in the eastern part of india uh, compared to the uh, rate of urbanization in india the you can uh, see that the urbanization in odisha is pretty much lagging behind at 16% and as per the projection made by the state government it would reach around 18% by 2021 you know uh, coming to the case study of puri you know puri is the fifth largest uh, city in the state of odisha and it is also the district headquarter but uh, the scale of urbanization of odisha you can understand by the fact that puri is the fifth largest city with only 0.2 million uh, population now it is also located on a cyclonic zone and hence it is highly vulnerable to uh, marine disasters now as per the 2011 census the population in puri has just crossed 0.2 million and it is you know expected to reach a, a population of about 0.34 million by 2031 so this kind of gives you an uh, you know a, a an overview that uh, the state the state of odisha is lagging behind when it comes to urbanization as compared to some of the other states which are you know rapidly progressing in this front uh coming to the local economy of puri you know the puri is uh, the economy is predominantly driven by the uh, tourism sector now it has the world famous uh, jagannath temple and the uh, beaches sea beaches so that is the main attraction of puri uh, also handicrafts uh, small scale small scale cottage industries agriculture and fisheries are the other sectors of the economy now uh, due to these uh, tourist uh, inflow during the uh, religious festivals to this city there is we uh, last year the total figure was around 5 million people tourists uh, visited puri now this puts a lots of uh, lots of pressure on the local resources infrastructure and the city administration during these events and uh, you know uh, people you know like this year the total attend uh, the total number of people who attended this event was around 1.5 million people over a span of 3 days so this puts a lots of pressure on the uh, infrastructure 
Now coming to uh, some of the urbanization issues, you know, since uh, Puri is located on a uh, coastal zone, the availability of fresh water is of you know paramount importance. But as we can see, that there are only two uh, fresh water pockets available in the city from which the groundwater is extracted, and these two are the only sources of water available to the city for getting the potable water. Now, over the year, uh, over the last couple of decades, you know, numerous slums and housing societies have come up in these areas, thus thereby, you know, shrinking the uh, aquifer recharge areas. Now, preserving these uh, areas would be of paramount importance if uh, we, we have to look at uh, sustainable urbanization. Also, uh, if you look at the uh, availability of open green spaces, you know, compared to some of the big cities and uh, some of the small cities in India, we can see that the uh, per capita available of uh, availability of uh, you know forest and recreational spaces in Puri is very low compared to some of the bigger cities, you know, Delhi, Chandigarh, Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, <clears throat> this availability is also an issue because it has very little designated uh, open spaces within the municipal area and therefore the uh, preservation of the existing open green spaces and you know provisions for adequate neighborhood and sectoral level green spaces should be prioritized uh, during development and this point has also been highlighted in the uh, draft comprehensive development plan of Puri. As I have already mentioned, uh, Puri is located uh, on the coast of the Bay of Bengal and hence, uh, as you can see that it has, uh, you know, encountered a total of about 94 number of cyclones in the last 100 years. Now, uh, these cyclonic storms, you know, expose people and landscape to the impact of different types of uh, hazards, you know, the high speed wind, you know, leads to physical destruction, the storm and the tidal surge leads to uh, saline inundation and this heavy torrential rain, it leads to flooding. Now it is uh, very important to preserve the open green spaces which absorb the uh, impacts of these uh, strong winds and also, also help uh, prevent flash floods. And uh, in an area which is uh, affected by saline inundation and groundwater uh, intrusion, the need for preserving the only two sweet water zones is paramount. Now coming to the interventions under ICBP, what we are doing in uh, uh, the state of Odisha. Now ICBP it is being jointly implemented by uh, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Poverty Elevation and GIZ. Now the main support is uh, given in making this affordable housing available to the urban poor, both in case of slum as well as non-slum areas. Now in case of Puri, we are intervening in the following uh, uh, components. First, we are focusing on preserving the open green spaces, water bodies and the sweet water zones. We are also preparing a housing for all plan of action plus, uh, which I'll uh, explain with you in a while. Then we are also preparing a few DPRs for, you know, focusing on the area based or cluster approach. And also we are assessing the current rental housing conditions available for the urban poor. Now, as per the uh, you know, mandate of the current government, uh, they have launched a new housing scheme called uh, Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, which uh, caters to housing uh, for the uh, urban areas, both in case of slum as well as non-slum areas. Now, if you look at the different criteria that they have proposed, in case of housing, the housing for all plan of action, which is uh, proposed by the ministry, which it only focuses on urban poor in slum and non-slum areas whereas we are intervening at a much higher level by capturing the you know the citywide housing sector as a whole also there is no uh, you know mandatory provision for special planning in the current mandate given by the ministry therefore we have included this special mapping of the city capturing the details such as the growth corridors uh, the potential redevelopment areas and relocation areas and we are also promoting this area-based cluster approach and we are also trying to synergize with the other ongoing uh, missions to you know, formulate projects. 
and also uh, under the uh, the new scheme there is the part the, the citizens particip participation is not mandatory and therefore we are you know strongly professing these uh, citizens particip participation to include all the stakeholders in the decision making <clears throat> now this is a draft uh, housing for all plan of action plus for puri where we have uh, done the uh, initial uh, uh, status report the housing assessment and uh, the development of the vision and we are also looking at the growth corridors and uh, based on that we are we have planning to develop this plan of action now for doing that uh, there is uh, we are strongly focusing on the stakeholder consultations by including a working group you know other community consultations we are also identifying at least three potential projects for housing and infrastructure upgradation now uh, <clears throat> as we said uh, that uh, you know like planning the city is not a, it is a process and not a product and hence these rules and guidelines which are you know drafted by the uh, government you know needs to be reconfigured to let the benefits reach the intended uh, target groups in an effective manner and therefore these policies need to be aligned with this philosophy uh, thank you thank you so much arpan it it's very interesting to see how uh, with the difficult conditions uh, within puri you are trying to get an get a community perspective and move everybody along um, but here again before we enter into the questions with you um should we try one uh, one attempt with sr i hope everything will work so i will just run back to sr presentation sr could you test your mic please hello can you hear me oh wonderful we can great wow <laughs> That's a good news. <laughs> okay, great. Great. So, if you could take over as presenter, it's at the top of the presentation. Yeah. What What do I have to do then? Uh, just click on that, take over as presenter, and then you can click the slides. Or if that does not happen, then I can do it for you if you say next. I. can't take over on some stage i think there is nothing i can click to take over okay then you start presenting and just say next and i will click <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah thanks a lot first of all for the invitation to take part at this webinar and um also the possibility to um presenting you some input from the vcp team in south africa from another continent So um I'm working in the inclusive violence and crime prevention program in uh, South Africa and this one runs in the second year of a second phase um next next slide please okay thanks so um on the contents um first of all um I would give you um, a brief overview on the South African context in terms of um violence then looking quickly on the three different areas of intervention of our program um then um trying to connect a bit with the sdgs and the new urban agenda and the um, the relevance they see in safety and crime and violence prevention and finally i also would like to give you two examples um of our daily work context next please so sorry this this slide is packed but um we had a limit on on slides so <laughs> but this is the only one that is so packed um So South South Africa um after the um, apartheid system so the last 20 years um is undergoing a quick urbanization um we have currently about 60% urbanized and in 2030 it will be uh, 71 and they even think that it's in 2050 around 80% so very a very quick process in urbanization um South Africa also belongs to the most violent countries in the world um homicide is just um one example there's of course also assault murder and all this but um homicide is a um quite good rate to compare internationally internationally so that's why i i just took this example 
Um, in South Africa, 34 people have been killed per um, 100,000 inhabitants um, during the last year. This is, um, as you can see, like five times the global average. Um, and um, just to give you a, a, a hint, um, is it, it's also more, um, so Africa, South Africa can be seen more violent than um, countries such as Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, or Nigeria. Um, crime and also interpersonal violence affects to a large extent the biggest cities here in South Africa. So, um, it's, and, and they also affect, um, I, this is, of course, it has a negative impact on um, quality of life for all the residents in the, in the cities, but um, as a second issue, it also affects socioeconomic development prospects. So in the end, it's also an interest of the whole country to, to, um, to lower the violence rate and not only um, for the victims. Who's effective? Uh, who's affected most um, of, of um, violent crime here in South Africa? It is um, the poor and marginalized communities. First of all, because they live in the neighborhood, in the neighborhoods that are highly affected by violent crime. Um, so we have, we see in, in, in data, we see a, um, a split in cities. So there is a high concentration in some um, neighborhoods, while others are, are quite fine. Um, and this, this is mostly here in townships, in informal settlements, and in poor and marginalized areas. Um, and we are call, yeah, we call them hotspot areas. Um, but but um, poorer people are also affected because they just they miss opportunities. Um, sometimes they are just less mobile. So just to take one example, um, especially women, they they can't. Um, take um, opportunities for education or employment um, because they they fear of walking in the darkness um, before sunrise or after darkness. So they can't get long distances. They can't travel them. Um, so what are the root causes for violent behavior? Um, I don't want to go into detail um, on, onto this because we could discuss this um, for, for, for um, quite a few time. But um, just to take one example for South Africa, um, it is quite important to see on the, to look at the uh, community and on the social level. So in South Africa, we have a huge problem on low level of social cohesion in communities. Um, urbanization is inadequately planned and, and managed. And um, there is still a um, huge heritage of the social, socio-spatial um, segregation that was caused by the former apartheid system. Um, so this also directly connects me to our program, um, because our approach is an integrated approach, and we're looking at different levels and different stakeholders and sectors. So it is a multi-level, multi-sectoral, and a multi-stakeholder approach. Next slide, please. Hello? Next slide, please. OK, thanks a lot. Um, so our main objective is working on the conditions for building safer communities with a specific focus on violence and crime prevention. And um, the idea is to improve um, conditions at the local level, but of course with the support from the national and provincial level. So such a proactive approach um, needs um, collaboration and support from different levels, and um, what we also try to, to foster is the participation of um, other relevant stakeholders um, from civil society, uh, and of course to also integrate and include the addressed communities. So we have three different areas of intervention, as you can see on the slide, um, closing the implementation gap, collaborative thinking and action, and active use for safer communities. Can I take over the slide now, or, um, or how is what, what is here set in, set in the measures? Can I just? No, I can't. Apparently, I can't do that. OK, doesn't matter. Just oh, was, that, was it me? Oh. Yeah, I can. Perfect. Okay. So I continue. Thank you. Nope. So, but we were on the first one here. So closing the implementation gap. 
Um, specifically, in, in this area of intervention, um, we see that um, government institutions already have a lot of diverse strategies, policies, and frameworks that highlight prevention issues. Um, and also um, really focus on a holistic um, um, or to take holistic measures. So I just came here two two months ago, and I was also impressed that there's a high yeah you see so many different strategies that have that have been elaborated already. Um, but the big but um, but they are not implemented at the local level. So the conditions um, to help to create safer communities um, are still missing at the local level. And that's what, um, why, we, why we call this area of intervention closing the implementation gap. One major challenge here is um, to clarify roles, responsibilities, and resources in the intergovernmental system. And this is also closely linked um, with the challenge of coordination. Um, I don't go through all the different um, measures that are um, listed here, but just to um, highlight one or two, um, there is a white paper on, on safety and security that has been revised in 2016, and we now um, collaborate with the Civilian Secretary for Police um, on the implementation. And there was also um, approved in 2016 an integrated urban development framework where, um, where um, urban safety is a cross-cutting issue in that framework. So this, this is already a, a big success, but or now it's, it's going yeah, on the implementation. Um, and this is, of course, on the national level, working with national ministries, but we also have, um, or we are working with local, um, local governments. And one, of, one example is the, um, in a project, in a pilot project in Johannesburg on um, establishing safer parks. And this is one example. I, I come back to that later. The second area of intervention is collaborative thinking and action. There, um, we try to um, connect people, getting better exchange networking and collaboration among different actors, because there are already um, practitioners working on, on the issues, um, but the idea is to connect and to get a better ex exchange. So um, in the first phase of VCP, there was created a Safer Spaces online portal. You can find it on www.saferspaces.co.za. And uh, another measure is the SACN Urban Safety Reference Group. This is a, um, a working group on urban safety, specifically dealing with the um, issues on violent crime and prevention. Um, and the eight largest cities uh, in South Africa take part in this, in this working group, and it is under the umbrella of the South African Cities Network. So this is quite good. Um, GIZ assists in that way, but um, we have an institution that um, leads the group, which is the South African City Network. Um, there are also um, other national um, institutions taking part, but the main focus is the, to have the core group from the local government. So, wait a second. The third area of intervention is active use for safer communities. And this is um, yeah, quite um, special that um, yeah, we really focus on, on the youth um, in, in this area of intervention. But it's, it's not surprising because in South Africa, you have half of the population is younger than 35. And most of them are victims or perpetrators of violence. So um, it should be natural to, to work with this group as well. Um, the problem is that youth are often not seen as like a really active change maker. Um, but yeah, um, the, um, our program um, tries to work with them. Um, and some of the support measures are um, on the provincial level, working there with, um, with the provincial government on um, safer communities. And um, there is also one local initiative um, to create a safer school networks in Nelson Mandela Bay. So this is just um, summarizing a bit. Um, 
here you have an overview on the multi-level approach of um, the violence and crime prevention approach. I don't uh, read all the different um, institutions, but just to see on the national level, there are different partners. Um, one important partner is the Department for Cooperative Governance and the Civilian Secretary uh, for the Police. There are um, two cities associations in the, the South African Local Government Association and the South African Cities Network that are already mentioned. And we also try to cooperate with the, with the Financial Ministry, which is National Treasury. Um, on the provincial level, there are two pilot provinces, which is Gauteng and the Eastern Cape. And on the local level, um, we have um, three pilot municipalities um, where we work together with local government. There is um, the provincial support going to local government and the South African uh, Cities Network member cities. So coming to the um, global level, um, yeah, as you know, the, the um, Agenda 2030 is here and we have seven goals for sustainable development. We have three goals identified um, which are directly um, linked to the topics of urban safety and violence prevention. And we have four further goals or, um, uh, where the goals or targets are um, dealing with specific risk factors for violence, um, for example, alcohol abuse. So on the new urban agenda, um, I wanted to connect it in some way with our program, but it's really it's really heavy because the new urban agenda paragraphs are really too long to read them out. I tried that once um, and I won't do it again. Um, <laughs> but um, just to to raise that in the new urban agenda, um, safety in public spaces is is a quite often used. Um, um, issue and desire that um, that is in the uh, final resolution. Um, and yeah, we, uh, there we have the two quotes. Uh, as I said, I won't read them out. So coming to my um, last section of my presentation, I would like to give two examples of our daily work. One of, the, one of it is in, located in the city of Johannesburg. Um, it's a pilot for a participatory park upgrading intervention. And this has been initiated by the department which is responsible for green public spaces in Johannesburg. So it's not, it has not been raised by the um, Safer Cities Department. It, it was raised by the one who is generally in charge for, um, um, yeah, for the green spaces. But now it runs in cooperation with the Johannesburg Department for Public Safety and also the Johannesburg Development Agency. Um, GIZ supports the project with technical assistance, um, but not with any financial um, support. The main problem that has been identified by the city of Johannesburg is that um, there is not only a lack of green spaces, um, specifically in the inner city of Johannesburg, but um, also there is a the existing public spaces are in very bad conditions. And it was also recognized um, that upgrading alone is not very successful because many um, users or potential users do not come automatically back and use the, um, the green spaces um, so that even upgraded parks um, deteriorate quickly again. So this was um, a moment where the department decided that they should um, come up with another approach, that they want to try something else. And that's why um, they came together with the other departments and looked for a participatory upgrading process. And the idea is not only to upgrade the park, but also to elaborate a strategy for safer public open spaces, to work on guidelines for replica replication, um, and to develop a long-term relationship with the users um, that, has been, that have been identified to manage the parks after the upgrading process. So what, what I want to say is um, the three departments currently work on the, on the strategy and the idea to replicate is, of course, to also take other parks that are at the moment in a, in a very 
uh, yeah, not nice um, st state um, to develop once um, or even before the upgrading process, get users and residents back to the park so that um, there is a community that really makes use of the park that can be also integrated into the later management of the park. This is one um, example. And the second one, I, I just wanted to take a bit more like the youth orientated um, issue in, into this presentation. So this is something that has already happened. Um, a toolkit on participatory safety planning has been developed by the um, VCP program in the first phase. Um, however, um, in the last year there came the, the come, there was another idea developed to train young people as potential facilitators so that they can use the tool um, for safety audits in their own communities. So this training took place um, in June this year with about 30 participant, participants. Mm, and yeah, as you can see, the objectives were um, to really get the trained trainers, uh, basically, um, so that they can go into their communities, do safety audits with, um, with the specific tools that are described in the in the toolkit. So this were the, the, these were two examples um, that I thought that were nice to, to be linked to the international commitments and to our topic um, on inclusive and equitable cities. Our current challenges um, are what I've been raising um, in the beginning was like these intergovernmental relations. So there is a lack of clarity on roles and responsibilities between the different spheres of governments. And this is something that is really, um, yeah, we are struggling a bit in, in our daily work. And um, another issue is also um, how to better support knowledge exchange between government institutions and civil society. So thanks a lot for your patience and your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Esther. Um, before I open the floor, I think there are already a couple of questions which have been answered. It was a very interesting uh, view of inclusiveness from three different people, one looking at infrastructure as a whole with different aspects, the other at affordable housing and third, of course, at crime and crime prevention and then inclusiveness. So with that, um, I, have, I have two questions here for Esther. And one is uh, what role the private sector plays in your GIZ project or its related activities or programs by the government? And the other also is uh, uh, the collaboration thinking and action is interesting. Do you also support or make use of crime mapping? If yes, who are your partners and involved stakeholders? Would you want to take these questions, Esther? Yes, sure. Thanks a lot. I start with the private sector. So we currently have um, more or less just one initiative where the private sector came um, in voluntarily and um, they, um, he's sponsoring a kind of um, community safety project in a specific locality here in South Africa. Um, the, it is uh, an industry called Mondi. I think it's textile industry. I'm not I'm not quite sure. Um, but so yeah, this is this is running, and I think it's um, yeah, it's a quite quite interesting collaboration. Um, in other activities, we um, we currently have not yeah got the private sector in. We are thinking of this Johannesburg Park projects. Um, there we are not thinking of like big industry or something, but maybe a small. Um, private sector that is um, located around um, the specific pilot park where we are um, currently working on. But this is still something that um, yeah, needs to, to figure out, but that would be an, an, an opportunity. Um, does it answer the question? Okay, I just go, ah, okay. Um, 
Then I go to the next, the crime mapping. Yes, of course, this is this is a tool which is um, frequently used, and we we are using it with um, different partners and different stakeholders. So, um, uh, for example, uh, mapping has been done. Um, for the upgrading process in Johannesburg, and this has been done um, on on the weekend, um, inviting people just to come into the park and just to um, yeah map specific um, focus areas where um, maybe where not crime happens if they don't know, but where they feel unsafe, and of course also to to map um, crime um, where it's already happened. Um, this is, of course, a participatory approach with the community. Um, we haven't um, worked together on crime mapping with the South African Police Service so far. Does it answer the question, Eva? Maybe till, till Eva responds. Okay, she, she's satisfied. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Esther. There was also one question for Eva on waste banks. You did try to answer that, Eva, but it would be very good if you could just explain. Because uh, in India also we have something very similar to uh, small-scale MRFs, which we call um, decentralized waste management systems. But uh, maybe it's similar or different, Eva? Um, yeah, actually, the idea of waste banks um, is, is quite initiated in uh, India and Indonesia. They're working a lot on that. So it means it's a small-scale material recovery facility that is often uh, operated by certain communities, areas, or and is really suitable for women as operators, as they can also um, can still be in charge for the for the child care, and um, because it is often linked to handicraft development. So uh, meanwhile, they are actually working in the recycling facility. Um, they are also preparing these, I, I think on my presentation you've seen it, also some kind of bags or certain, uh, yeah, certain handicrafts. Um, in India there are a lot of examples and, and the, uh, it's, it's quite good to, uh, to integrate uh, women in it and also to enable some employment measures. Okay, sounds, sounds really interesting. Thank you, Eva. There's also another question from uh, Alfred Eberhardt. Um, he, he says that for activities of waste in India and the sanitation sector, integration of informal sector is essential. Would you be able to define some success factors for inclusion from Indonesia or Colombo? Yeah. In Colombo, we didn't work on uh, waste management. Oh, okay, but uh, in, in sanitation. So um, in Indonesia also, uh, well, it's quite essential for sure because especially on the landfill, you have already um, a lot of people working in the informal sector. It is still something, um, I mean, through in our studies, we try to address it and also to, to recommend on how to, um, either it is a bit um, how to involve them into into the formal sector or rather to also um, accept it and um, yeah I'm, I'm a bit careful but uh, we, we called it in our um, in one of our symposiums actually to to informalize um, yeah the the formal sector um, so also to allow that uh, the, these people are you know re somehow registered and and you know how they are involved in the project um, in the sanitation, I have to say, in Colombo, it is a main, um, it's a quite huge project. So um, we haven't been working on a lot of the um, of, of the small scale uh, projects. But in sanitation, you have uh, a, um, you have possibilities if it's more on, for example, all the uh, community toilets or uh, whatever it is. 
But um, success factors, I would I would say a success factor is actually also to um, because it's easy. Some uh, it's sometimes not uh, not that easy to involve them in the formal sector. So to look for both ways. On one hand, to to integrate them, and on other hand, also to accept it, to register them, and to to keep track also um, who who is involved and involve them maybe with some benefits that are not provided by the government that can be provided by, for example, an operator of the landfill. I, okay, I hope that answers Alfred's question. Uh, but um, before I take the last question, which is here on urban mobility, okay, uh, there's, a, there's one more coming. I was wondering, I had a question from Arpan. Um, is there... Uh, uh, some planning regulation that uh, that um, you know manages either the national level or at the um, at the local level, which which looks at managing the demand for affordable housing for urban poor in India or whatever that is existing is it sufficient? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, regarding the question uh, asked by Vaishali, uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, the current government they have been working on a few uh, programs which are aimed at providing affordable housing for the uh, to the urban poor. The first one is the you know updation of the national urban housing and habitat policy, which was last revised in. 2007, and now uh, they are planning to uh, revise it again in 2017. So they are uh, constituting a, a group, working group, who, who will be uh, giving an, uh, giving their inputs regarding what are the different pillars that are to be addressed uh, regarding this. And also, the current ministry is working on developing, a, you know, draft national urban rental housing policy. Uh, the draft has already already been prepared uh, with support from GIZ, ICPP, and it has been submitted to the cabinet for approval. Now it uh, it addresses two main uh, uh, sectors: it's uh, the social rental housing as well as market-driven rental housing. And for the first time, the uh, Indian government they have uh, you know recognized the informal sector, and they are also taking uh, you know different provisions for. Uh, including them uh, in this uh, program and uh, thank you arpan mm, uh, i totally agree uh, with what you uh, what the other people are rapidly typing i can i can see there's a lot of interest now suddenly but before uh, before we move to the to the other questions Maybe this question on urban mobility. I know CDIA has a has a big portfolio, Eva. But could you tell us on inclusiveness and urban mobility? That's that sometimes tends to be tricky, right? Eva. Yeah. 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 Thank you a lot, Vashali. Um, yeah, in inclusiveness and, and, and transport, actually, uh, we have a lot of these examples. It was one of our biggest portfolio, um, now now the second after, uh, after the water sector. So there are examples, actually. We provided uh, huge infrastructure uh, investment projects, for example, the, the BRT system in Islamabad in Pakistan, or a, a pro poor urban transport project that was also linked uh, or, or supported by GIZ uh, in Kulna in Bangladesh. Um, and one of our may, most famous is actually in Indonesia. We did one study in three cities in Indonesia, in Solo, um, Palembang, and I think Yogyakarta. Um, there, we uh, f for sure we work closely with the SUTIP, with the Sustainable Urban Transport Program in Indonesia. That is, uh, I, I think it's um, it will be completed by this year. 
But um, it was a benefit because uh, they said, okay, we need a lot of consultants at the moment for a short period to also to raise attention, uh, to do something in the city, to analyze what are the possibilities, especially informal, formal transport. So um, some of the identified um, issues were, was, for example, to provide uh, separate lanes for unmotorized and uh, motorized transport. Uh, quite simple uh, to provide sidewalks, uh, also street lightning. Uh, it was connected to safe parking and um, yeah, public transport, and especially how to shape uh, the tariff system affordable. If you are interested, I can have a look. I think we have it on our web page. This study. So uh, f otherwise, I'm I'm happy to share it with the whole group. Um, and I think uh, Im important is always uh, that we uh, that we consider uh, informal transport and especially that we uh, not have this image in Asia. It's still like um, poor people walk or drive bicycle or go by rickshaw, and the rich people have uh, their own car. So um, I think this whole concept on that, uh, for example, in Germany, the bankers are also driving with their bicycle to, to work. I think it still needs to be changed, but for sure it's also something that um, is, um, well, considering the climate uh, and, and also the poli pollution in some Asian cities or, or safety issues that we still have to, to face. And I think in urban planning, it's very important to address this from the beginning. And uh, in Indonesia, it was good because uh, we provided the study in 2011, and the SUTIP program um, is still working with these cities. So we had actually a win-win situation with the regional program of CDIA and uh, the bilateral program that is in the country and that can look also for long-term capacity development measures. Thank you, Eva. Esther, would you like to throw a little light on uh, transport in terms of safety? And maybe then that could be then the last question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Pashali. Um, yeah, we are currently not working on, on urban mobility, although it's, it is a big issue. Um, first and foremost, on pub public transport, um, which is considered as very unsafe um, here in South African cities. Um, but so you are getting easily like in, into a, like a devil circle that um, nobody uses the public transport, everybody buys a car, and, and then, yeah just um, other issues coming in, like environmental issues as well. Um, but we are considering it to start working on it because it's really a big issue and it's uh, first and foremost an, an gender issue as well, so that women um, fear um, to take public transport or even to walk uh, until uh, or where, where, um, to the street where they could take a public transport. Um, so it is a, a topic that um, is, is um, considered to, to include in our in the program. Um, on, on what Eva just said with bicycles, it's just the same here in South Africa. So um, it's just considered as, as not being adequate to ride a bicycle, um, and um, I think there should yeah there must be first a change also in, um, in society to really um, start working on this. Yeah, I totally agree with both of you. I think it's the same story in India as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think with, uh, we'd, we've, I would like to then conclude the webinar today. We've really overshot the time, and I think it was a very lively discussion. Um, uh, thank you so much, Eva, Esther, and Arpa for your presentations and uh, with a slightly, with a little bit of glitches, I think we managed pretty well. This is also the first time that we were using Skype for business. So thank you, Teresa, for all the help that you gave us. Thanks, Lucy, for all the coordination. Thank you so much and look forward to, to our next webinar, which will now in all probability be sometime in January. Lucy will keep everybody updated. Thank you.